American intelligence revealed the arrival of the missiles in Cuba, the crisis was immediate. As we hear, with the help of America's ABC TV Nightline program in these tapes from the White House. These are the pictures that drove the world to the brink of nuclear war. When American U-2 spy plane photos revealed the missile threat from Cuba, President Kennedy had to weigh up the risks of taking them out by force. What would the Russians do? Third, if we do nothing, then we'll, uh, they'll have these missiles and they'll be able to say again, yeah, any time we ever try to do anything about Cuba, and they'll uh, fire these missiles, so that I think it's uh, dangerous, but uh, rather uh, satisfactory from their point of view. So what should America do? If we go in and take them out of a quick airstrike, we neutralize the chance of danger to the United States of these missiles being used. And then the president contemplated the ultimate gamble. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we increased the chance greatly, as I think they, there's bound to be a reprisal from the Soviet Union, there always is. Uh, they're just going in and taking Berlin by force at some point, which leaves the only one alternative, which is to fire nuclear weapons, which is a hell of an alternative, and begin a nuclear exchange. But the most startling voice on the tape is that of General Curtis LeMay, the Air Force chief who was the model for the bomb-happy general in the film Dr. Strangelove, goading the president to start a nuclear war. Uh, I don't share your view that uh, if we knock off Cuba, they're going to knock off the man. Uh, we've got the Berlin problem, sir, and states anyway. If we don't do anything to Cuba, then they're going to push on to land and push real hard because they got us on the run. Uh, if we take military action against Cuba, then... Uh, and this is where the defiant LeMay urged the president to reject lesser options such as a blockade or political pressure. Uh, I don't think we're going to make any reply. No, if we tell them that the Korean situation is just like it's always been, if they make a move, we're going to fight. This uh, uh, blockade and, and political action I see leading into war. Yeah, that's the uh, This is almost as bad as the achievement of Dunia. Uh, I just don't see any other solution except direct military intervention right now. In that room with LeMay and the President was the Defence Secretary, Robert McNamara. He watched Kennedy struggling to keep the Hawks in check and prevent a nuclear holocaust. He was determined to try to avoid it. Not all of his associates believed that would be possible or perhaps even desirable. General LeMay, for one. He believed without any question that at some time the U.S. and the Soviet Union were going to have to fight a nuclear war. And it was far better, in his opinion, to do it when we had a vast superiority in, in numbers. A fact LeMay confirmed to a friend many years later when he said, we'd have been a hell of a lot better off if we'd got World War III started in those days. LeMay was confident that Soviet nuclear weapons had not reached Cuba, but he turned out to be wrong. The tapes reveal Kennedy grappled with the practical difficulties of an imminent nuclear war. He even contemplated evacuating America's cities before opting for the peaceful tactic of the blockade, which persuaded Khrushchev to pull out. Well, I'm joined on the phone now by Pierre Salinger, who was President Kennedy's press secretary. Uh, Mr. Salinger, does it make you sweat a bit remembering those conversations? I remember those conversations very well, sir, and uh, I was particularly struck by what LeMay was saying because uh, for us to attack that early uh, was not what Kennedy wanted to do. He understood something that I think is very important historically, and that is uh, putting that, uh, the, uh, the ships around uh, Cuba and then getting into dialogue with uh, Khrushchev, but not only direct dialogue, but something that has always been in the mindset of the Soviets and even the Russians today, what they call back-channel talks. And actually, from, September, from the middle of September 19... 61 until Kennedy was assassinated there were 45 extraordinary letters that went back and forth in a back channel wave between Kennedy and Khrushchev uh, as they were talking about how they could uh, make the situation better and unfortunately uh, most of those have never been published so that the American public and the rest of the world doesn't know about that back channel but five of them uh, were published finally uh, when they got to the 30th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis and they showed how they were doing this dialogue between them, which brought an end to this crisis.
But just remind us how dangerous it was at the time. I mean, Curtis LeMay sounded as if he was ready to get to nuclear war almost. We were right on the edge of nuclear war, and actually it would have been either, it would have even been a worse war, because when we got to uh, Saturday, the 27th of October, uh, and that was when uh, we were going to make a decision, and actually that night uh, we were at the meeting, and Kennedy said, I want all of you, you, you none of you have been home for a week, uh, you haven't seen your wife, your children, go home, we'll make the decision tomorrow morning. Well, the decision was going to be made. Uh, whether we were going to uh, invade Cuba or whether we were going to bomb uh, those areas or whether we were going to do both those things. Uh, and, of course, that would have uh, created a nuclear war. But uh, one of the things that is fascinating is uh, it's a number of things that we didn't know at that particular time that are even worse. Right. For, for example, right. in 1989, we had a uh, an incredible conference in Moscow with 10 Americans, 10 Soviets, 10 Cubans. Uh, who were putting on the table all kinds of information that the other sides didn't know at that time. And I'll give you one example. Uh, the CIA had told us that uh, there were 10,000 Soviet troops in Cuba. Right. We discovered there were 50,000 Soviet troops and they had nuclear guns. Good gracious. Thank you, but PSL, thank you very much indeed for all that. I'm going to turn now to Anthony Howard of the Times, who was at that time covering the crisis uh, in Cuba, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis for the New Statesman. What memories do you have? I have memories of tremendous fear, really absolutely windy in London. Uh, I can remember being rung up by a wife of a Labour MP, a Labour front bencher, saying, you know, it's going to be war, this kind of thing, what are we going to do? And of course, poor old, um, you know, those CND committee of 100 people, they sort of did a bunk to Ireland because they were so terrified. It was, in my view, easily the nearest moment we got to a nuclear conflagration. How, how robust? Do you believe now, with all that you've read since, yeah. the British government was in supporting President Kennedy? I think that the uh, Foreign Secretary, Lord Hume, was very robust. I think that uh, Mr. Macmillan, the Prime Minister, was much less robust. Really? And indeed, Dennis Greenhill, I think, uh, wrote down at the time that the, America, the British ambassador in Washington said, thank God the ships have turned round before the Prime Minister gave way. And I think they were, the Americans were very frightened that Macmillan would try and intervene with the Soviet leadership, and they didn't want that for a moment. So I think we weren't absolutely steady on parade in this country. Do you get a sense, listening to these tapes, of a real struggle there in the White House between the hawks and the doves? Oh, absolutely. And, of course, one of the things this thing get brought up was that famous phrase about hawks and doves came out of an article in the uh, uh, Saturday Evening Post, I think, by Stuart Alsop and Charlie Bartlett. And there was a great conflict. Uh, I think, to be fair, Bobby Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, was the hero of it. He was the Attorney General, and he, from the beginning, knew that this should not go to nuclear war and did his very best to prevent it. The other hero, oddly enough, was an English person who was David Ormsby Gore, who was the British ambassador in Washington, and who was the first person to say, don't let's have this quarantine limit at uh, f uh, at 800 miles, let's push it back to 500 miles. And the president, President Kennedy, accepted that, and that gave time for the Russians to think. If that hadn't happened, and the U.S. Navy had kept the quarantine limit at 800 miles, goodness knows what would have happened. Andy Howe, thank you very much indeed. And.